This is in the state of Michigan Court of Appeals. This is in the case of the people of the state of Michigan versus Dawn Marie Dixon Bay. Defendant Dawn Marie Dixon Bay appeals as of right her sentence for second degree murder. This case returns to this court following our decision vacating defendant's first sentence and ordering resentencing. We again vacate defendant's sentence and remand for resentencing before a different judge. So things are already getting spicy if you are not just remanding the case, but you're now going before a different judge. In defendant's prior appeal, this court set forth the following background facts. Defendant Dawn Marie Dixon Bay was arrested after admittedly stabbing her boyfriend, Gregory Stack, the victim, to death in their home on February 14th, 2015, a Valentine's Day massacre. At first, she claimed that the victim must have been stabbed during an altercation with others before returning to their home. Later, defendant admitted that she was the person who stabbed the victim, but she claimed that she had only done so in self-defense. She was subsequently charged with first-degree murder and, after an eight-day jury trial, was found guilty of second-degree murder. So, charged with first-degree murder, guilty of second-degree murder. Defendant's sentencing guidelines were a minimum range of 12 to 20 years, but the trial court imposed a sentence of 35 to 70 years, which is way outside of the sentencing guidelines and needs to be justified. On appeal, this court affirmed defendant's conviction, but vacated her sentence and remanded for resentencing. We held that the trial court's upward departure of 15 years above the top of defendant's guidelines range violated the principle of proportionality. The trial court erred by failing to adequately explain why its sentence was more proportionate than a guidelines sentence, and the trial court erred by concluding that defendant had a noteworthy criminal history on this record. We also held that none of the factors discussed by the trial court provided a reasonable basis for a departure sentence because those factors were either accounted for by the sentencing guidelines or inconsistent with the scoring of the guidelines. We noted that we were highly skeptical of a trial court's decision to sentence a defendant convicted of second-degree murder as though the murder were premeditated. That sentence pretty much describes the issue on appeal that the judge treated the defendant as having committed first-degree murder even though she was convicted of second-degree murder. We observed that many factors relied upon by the trial court were neither special nor relevant. At defendant's resentencing hearing, the trial court again acknowledged that defendant's minimum sentence guidelines were 12 to 20 years. The trial court again resentenced her to 30 to 70 years of incarceration. So they just knocked five years off the sentence. Proportionality. After this court's opinion in defendant's prior appeal, but before the trial court held the resentencing hearing, our Supreme Court decided People v. Beck. Beck held that, unlike uncharged conduct, a trial court is forbidden from using acquitted conduct when crafting a sentence. Our Supreme Court explicitly held that it violates a defendant's right to due process when a judge increases a defendant's sentence because the judge believes that the defendant really committed one or more of the crimes on which the jury acquitted. As this court has observed, there may be situations under which it is not obvious what conduct should be considered acquitted. However, this is not one of those situations. The jury acquitted defendant of first-degree murder and convicted her of second-degree murder. It could not be plainer that the jury acquitted defendant of first-degree murder because it found that the element of premeditation was not established. Nevertheless, the trial court, in its own words, gave defendant an additional 10 years in prison for a cold-blooded, premeditated stabbing of a victim of this community. The trial court's blatant refusal to follow Beck persisted, despite both attorneys advising the trial court that Beck prohibited the use of acquitted conduct when crafting a sentence. After the trial court stated its view that the murder was premeditated, the prosecutor, the prosecutor stated, quote, your honor, you have the right to believe that it was first degree murder, but the Michigan Supreme Court has, for better or worse, ruled that you're not allowed to consider that in sentencing. That's what the bottom line is. Little bit of legal interpretation here. You have the right to due process. The process of law that is due to you 
as part of your basic human rights. Rights under the U.S. Constitution, rights in the ethereal philosophy of law and governance and participation in the social contract that is your membership as a resident or citizen or, or person uh, under the jurisdiction of a court. Due process means both procedurally and substantively that you have the right to a fair trial. You have the right to a procedure that allows you to present your defense and present your case, to have a fair adjudication by an unbiased court, that you have certain underlying rights to fairness and justice as well, and that you can't just be taken to what we would call like a kangaroo court, which is a court in name only, and you're just put before a judge and they say some words and then throw you in jail without accounting for your alibi or your defense or, or your appeals and things like that. So what they're saying here is that it is a violation of your due process rights to have been acquitted of one crime, convicted of a slightly different or lesser offense, but then get a sentence from a judge as if you had committed the charged but acquitted crime. Apparently it is not a due process violation if you are accused of a different crime but not acquitted, or, or you're not charged and, and not acquitted of a different crime. But because this defendant was convicted of second degree murder on a charge of first degree murder, the judge can't then go back and say, well, I'm going to sentence you as if you committed first degree murder because I think you really did. So back to the case, and, and this is the good part. No law or rule obligates courts or individual judges to agree with decisions and opinions from higher courts, nor is there any law or rule obligating courts or judges to pretend to agree with decisions and opinions from higher courts. However, courts are obligated to comply with decisions and opinions from higher courts. We remind the trial court that, Michigan has a hierarchical judicial system, and trial courts are required to follow applicable rules, orders, and case law established by appellate courts, including the United States Supreme Court. This structure is essential to the orderly, uniform, and equal administration of justice. A trial court is not free to disregard rules, orders, and case law with which it disagrees or to become a law unto itself. Although a trial court is not required to agree with appellate rules, orders, and case law, as with litigants and all other citizens seeking to comply with the law, the court is required in good faith to follow those rules, orders, and case law. Judges, like all other persons, are required to act within the law. This is the essence of the rule of law, and this is the essence of the equal rule of law. To be clear, lower courts must follow decisions of higher courts even if they believe the higher court's decision was wrongly decided or has become obsolete. If a trial judge is unable to follow the law as determined by a higher appellate court, that trial judge is in the wrong line of work. That trial judge is in the wrong line of work. So the appeals court gets this case for the second time on the same issue. The lower court judge has decided to make a decision in the defendant's case that is outside of the rule of law. And they've done it twice now, as if the lower court has the right to overrule the appellate court, which is not how any of this works. Telling the lower court judge, look, if you're not going to do your job, you shouldn't be in this job, is about as big of a smackdown as you get from the appellate court. And of course, the case is then about to be reassigned to a different judge because the appellate court now does not think that this court, this lower court, this lower judge is unbiased or is, is willing to follow their precedent. And think of the defendant who this whole time, while she might be incarcerated for the second degree offense, still has to either pay an attorney or the taxpayer has to pay an attorney to file these unnecessary appeals which can often cost thousands of dollars for writing and research and then appearing in court and, and defending. And fortunately, this should be one of the easier appeals on a well-established issue. But this is just a waste of time. This is a waste of time and a waste of judicial resources. And I can tell you, 
if I, as an attorney, waste judicial resources, I can be fined, I can be suspended from the court, I can be disciplined on my law license, I can be suspended from the practice of law, and I can be disbarred. I can be punished severely for wasting court resources, as should happen to this judge. But because judges are typically not disciplined like that, I doubt that this judge will have any fallout or discipline other than being smacked down by the appeals court and reassigned. Back to the case. The trial court's upward sentence departure based on its finding of premeditation and deliberation contrary to the jury's verdict was an abuse of discretion and a willful violation of controlling precedent from our Supreme Court. We therefore need not consider the trial court's other stated justifications for imposing a departure sentence. There's also a footnote here. This court has not previously held, and we do not now hold, that an upward departure from defendant sentencing guidelines would always or necessarily constitute an abuse of discretion. So we're just saying in this case or under these exact circumstances. Here's more about allocution. Defendant further argues that she was deprived of her right to allocution, we agree. At the resentencing, after both attorneys informed the trial court that it was not permitted to factor its belief that defendant committed first-degree murder into sentencing, the following exchange occurred. The court says, Ms. Bay, is there anything that you'd like to tell the court for further consideration at your resentencing? Defendant, well, since I've been here, I've tried to do all, uh, get into all the programming I can as far as, like, anger management, grief counseling. All my programming for paroling and all of that, I can't get into because of the years I have. So she's been denied these rehabilitative programs because her sentence is too long. I got into my jobbing is like for visual aid, wheelchair aid, things like that to help other people out because of the things I've done. I take responsibility for what I did. I can't stress enough how the court interrupts. Well, let me ask you, do you think you took responsibility for it when you were sentenced? The defendant says, I did take responsibility. I took a life that didn't belong to me. I took a life from his children, from his family, from everybody that knew him. And that is something that I'm going to have to deal with for the rest of my life, that I took a life that didn't belong to me. I should not have took that life. I should. That's my burden. And the court interjects. And how do you think you took his life? What do you mean? Defense counsel interjects, Your Honor, the court, no, no. Your Honor, I'm not trying. You know counsel. The defendant says, I took. The court says, go ahead. I'll just comment on the facts myself. Defendant said, I killed him. The court says, yeah, with two stab wounds directly to the heart, right? That's not in dispute. Defense counsel, Your Honor, can I place something on the record? I want to make a record. The court, sure, go ahead, counsel. Defense counsel, yes, I would object. I don't think this is appropriate to rehash all of this, and we're not. The court interrupts. Okay, I'm the one that's answering and asking a couple, and then there's multiple interruptions. The court says, questions to your client who wants to testify, all right? And she tells me she's remorseful, and I asked her, how did you kill him? I mean, I sat as the trial judge. I'm intimately aware of how she killed him. Defense counsel. Again, I just put my objection on the record. It's your courtroom, Your Honor. I know that position. Obviously, you will make the decisions and call the shots. I just want to place an objection on the record. The court. Your objection is noted, counsel. Let's move on. Anything further, Ms. Bay? Defendant. No, sir. The court. All right. Thank you. So based on that, it sounds like she wasn't allowed to speak and say anything that she thinks would help lower her sentence. Thereafter, the prosecutor again noted that the trial court was not permitted to consider defendant to have committed first-degree murder, but it urged the trial court to consider other reasons for departing upward from the sentencing guidelines. As an initial matter, allocution is not testimony. Defendant was not sworn in, and even if she had been sworn in, it would not have been the trial court's role to conduct what was effectively a cross-examination. Furthermore, the trial court actively prevented defendant from expressing remorse and responsibility after the crime by focusing on the crime itself and its impermissible interpretation of that crime. The trial court's commentary indicated that it wished to provide its own testimony, seemingly in the pursuit of a sentencing decision that it had already decided upon 
before allocution and contrary to the law as explained by both attorneys. So if you had the same question I did from before, allocution is the defendant testifying in their favor during sentencing. You have a right to testify about why you think the sentence should be lower. Or I guess higher, but who does that? The trial court was, of course, not under any obligation to accept anything defendants said, and it would have been appropriate for the trial court to state as much when imposing a sentence. Furthermore, a single interruption, where a defendant otherwise receives a reasonable opportunity to speak, does not deprive the defendant of the right to allocution. It would also have been appropriate for the court to interrupt for the purpose of seeking clarification of a defendant's statements. However, allocution is the defendant's opportunity to address the court, not the court's opportunity to conduct an interrogation or deliver a lecture. The trial court may deliver a lecture or express its disbelief afterwards during sentencing, but during allocution, it must permit the defendant a meaningful opportunity to speak. Michigan Code of Judicial Conduct, Canon 3A12, states that a judge should avoid interruptions of counsel in their arguments except to clarify their positions, and should not be tempted to the unnecessary display of learning or a premature judgment. The same principle applies to a defendant's allocution. Defendant declined to speak further, following the trial court's dismissive response to her attorney's objection to the trial court grilling defendant instead of listening to her. Under the circumstances, that can hardly be construed as an expression of satisfaction. It is far more likely to have been the result of intimidation in the light of the fact that the trial court had abandoned its role as an impartial magistrate and instead usurped the role of prosecutor. Defendant would reasonably have wished to avoid incurring even further displeasure from the trial court. Under the circumstances, it is clear defendant was offered only an illusory and superficial opportunity for allocution. The distinction between a conversation and an argument may not always be clear, but the trial court plainly violated defendant's rights here. Remember I talked about a kangaroo court, a court in name only? This was allocution in name only. In fact, it may have been intimidation from the judge, intimidation that prevented the defendant from even wanting to speak in their defense, lest they offend the judge even more. Remand before a different judge. Defendant finally argues that resentencing should be assigned to a different trial court judge. We agree. When a case is remanded for resentencing, the reviewing court may determine that the resentencing be carried out by a different judge. In determining whether to reassign, there are three factors. One, whether the original judge would reasonably be expected upon remand to have substantial difficulty in putting out of his or her mind previously expressed views or findings determined to be erroneous or based on evidence that must be rejected. Does the trial court have the ability to learn from the appeals court decision and conduct themselves in the adjusted manner? And I'm going to say no. This judge has already had this chance twice and they uh, did not do it. Whether reassignment is advisable to preserve the appearance of justice. And three, whether reassignment would entail waste and duplication out of proportion to any gain in preserving the appearance of fairness. I'm going I'm to think it's number one here, but let's, uh, let's see what they say. The trial court's abandonment of impartiality and unwillingness to follow the law would be bad enough. But the trial court also went so far as to state on the record, and they want another judge to do it again, and maybe they can convince some judge that, oh, I should only get 12 years for second-degree murder when I stabbed somebody in the heart twice. This statement further reflects the inability of the trial court to conform its rulings to the law, and the appearance of justice can only be preserved by reassigning this case on remand. The trial court apparently failed to recognize that it was not limited to a 12-year minimum sentence. It could have sentenced defendant to 20 years and remained within the guidelines, drastically curtailing appellate review. Furthermore, although we express no opinion under the circumstances as to their substantive merit, the prosecutor argued to the trial court that there were other possible grounds for an upward departure that would not have contravened Beck. In other words, by making this 30 to 70 year decision a second time, the judge pretty much foreclosed the sentence the judge was talking about, how they didn't want somebody to go to jail for only 12 years for second degree murder. 
But the judge wasn't bound to a 12-year sentence. The judge could have at least gone for 20 years if they wanted to, and maybe even a slightly upward departure from there, but not 30 to 70 years based on a finding of first-degree murder when the defendant was acquitted of first-degree murder and only found guilty of second-degree murder. So the judge, by making this biased and unnecessary decision, hurt their own wish for a larger sentence for the defendant. They, they got greedy with the sentencing and missed the opportunity to impose the sentence that they wanted in the first place. It was uh, very short-sighted for a judge, but it happens. Furthermore, the trial court's conduct and statements may warrant investigation by the Judicial Tenure Commission. Okay, maybe there will be discipline for the judge doing this. Defendant's sentence is vacated and this matter is remanded for resentencing before a different judge. We do not retain jurisdiction. So if there's another appeal, the case will go before the appeals court brand new and get assigned to whichever judges it gets assigned to. So that was really remarkable. You can't sentence somebody for first degree murder when they were only convicted of second degree murder. And if you do so twice and you disobey the appeals court, you may be told you're in the long, you're in the long line of work. You may be told that you're in the wrong line of work. I think that's really remarkable and a, a bit of schadenfreude that you might enjoy. I, I think it's justice for the defendant. Uh, don't get me wrong. If she is convicted of stabbing somebody in the heart twice and it's second degree murder, she should go to jail for the 12 to 20 years. Longer if there are real reasons to depart from the guidelines sentence. But the judge had the ability to sentence her to 20 years, maybe even a little bit more. But sentencing her to 30 to 70 years was way outside of the guidelines, unjustified, as in he didn't explain a justification because, or, or I mean, he tried to, but because he made the decision based on a finding of first degree murder, that sort of, it did invalidate any other justification for an upwards departure. Now this has to go back a third time, well, it goes back a second time for a third sentencing hearing where a new judge will decide Ms. Bay's fate. What's her name? Ms. Dixon Bay's fate. Let me know what you think of that one in the comments below. We learned a little bit about sentencing and guidelines and what happens when you disobey the appeals court. Don't disobey the appeals court. You can, you can certainly appeal the appeals court's decision. Judges can't appeal the appeals court decision. Parties can. But don't disobey the appeals court, especially when you're the lower court that is subject to the precedent, case precedent, and the jurisdiction and the authority of the appeals court. Unbelievable. Unbelievable that a judge would waste judicial resources like this, especially when us attorneys get constantly reminded not to waste judicial resources. Here, the judge is wasting the party's time, the court's time, the appeals court's time, and really the only benefit from this is that we got a good story out of it. I mean, think about it. There's really nothing good that came out of this case. Ms. Dixon Bay has had her time wasted, her lawyer's time wasted. The prosecutor has had their time wasted, their office's time wasted. The courts have had their time wasted. Nothing good comes out of this case except that we can tell the public about it and, and have the public learn and be reassured that there really is justice for people who have judges act outside of the law. That's the best I can make from this as a, as a sort of silver lining. Let me know what you think the silver lining is in the comments below. Let me know how offended you are at the waste of judicial resources and the party's resources in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my top supporters in February, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hytov, Ugly Grill, Gut Broge, Torpedon, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, Pure Magma, Tech Tech Potato, Eric Tams, and the Blood Soaked Survivors. You can support Lawful Masses on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsus.com slash law, through YouTube memberships and through Floatplane subscriptions. 
Join me for our weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everybody has a great week. I love you all. Bye. has the right or ability to overrule the appeal at, the appeal at court dixon bay ms dixon bay's face face gosh what is wrong with me today i predict a few jump cuts this week no <laughs>